tonight. Could there be an agenda at play? Minister of Foreign Affairs Dinesh Gunawardana believes that the Swiss Embassy incident is an attempt to smear the country's new political leadership ahead of elections. The request has to fly her and her family to Switzerland for treatment by bringing a hospital plane. That, that the sequence of events did not correspond by witness interview. Constructive terminology. Touching on the Tory two states reference, Dr. Palita Kohona says Sri Lanka can mind its own affairs without colonial interference. I wonder whether this was a piece of constructive use of language to keep the British Tamil happy. Unity for the UNP. Speaker Karu Jayasuriya claims that the chief prelates want his interference in uniting the UNP. Waning weather. The Med Department promises a respite in inclement weather just over the horizon. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine. This Wednesday, the 4th of December, 2019. AC Nicking Cut Winner. Anti mouthwash summoning and a close up gel lecker. Story ek start karana. Hi. Hi. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at Nine. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Now, the alleged Swiss embassy abduction incident has had its share of twists and turns, creating a sense of confusion regarding the actual circumstances surrounding the events as reported by the Swiss embassy. Investigations are ongoing, but law enforcement officials have had their hands tied as key facts remain unavailable with the proposed or supposed rather victims still unwilling to come forward and record an official statement. Minister of Foreign Affairs Dinesh Gunawardhan today held a media briefing where he attempted to clear out some confusion surrounding the events and highlighted the government's response to what he believes is a concerted effort to smear the new political leadership in the run-up to key parliamentary elections. Given the confusion surrounding the Swiss Embassy abduction incident in the past week, Minister of Foreign Affairs Dinesh Gunawardana and Secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Ravinath Arisingha held a media briefing today to state the government's position and clear up some of the confusion surrounding it. The Foreign Ministry summoned all the High Commissioners and Ambassadors. We explained to them the truth behind the present investigation on the complaint received by the ambassador on an employee of, of his embassy being victimized according to him and abducted according to him on the 25th of last month. We met the ambassador on the 27th early morning when it was brought to our notice. We also have requested that the embassy cooperate by asking this person to make a statement with the CID. And the investigation needs also a statement or a complaint by the so-called victim. Up to now, this has not been given by the victim. Instead, the request has come to fly her and her family out of the country to Switzerland for medical treatment by bringing a hospital plane that is available, which they had tried to bring, but uh, we have advised that uh, to follow the normal procedures adopted by an embassy. Most of the Matters mentioned by the embassy and the officials have been uh, properly checked by the police and we have explained to the ambassador that they have uh, very little truth in the main allegation. That is the situation. Attorney General has made an application to court. The court gave order yesterday allowing a statement to be recorded and until then to prevent the so-called complainant to be leave in the country. And we feel this is all another step of misinformation, spreading falsehood, throwing mud at the political leadership of our country. Just before elections, the same thing in different form was campaigned. The country rejected it. Police and all investigation Institutions are on the job. They have found enough information. All that shows that the so-called victim's complaint has no standing. There was our ambassador also has traveled to Bern and met the Swiss Foreign Ministry and placed all these facts. Also the Swiss Foreign Ministry finally also conveyed to the ambassador that if the person can be brought by the hospital plane, the treatment could be uh, given. Her protection has been guaranteed. Her family, relatives protection have been guaranteed and we have, our police has taken all necessary steps to give the necessary security to the people 
concern. I hope the media also cooperates because a lot of falsehood, a lot of misinformation has spread and is bad for the country. We must understand we have come out of a lot of such misinformation that we should give more the truth available to the people rather than various other agendas that are tried to be worked by people who have been defeated by the people. Now, what was requested by the ambassador was that the person be given protection. But she was not available to in any place to be given protection after the ambassador brought this to our note. Secondly, the family. The family also has moved out and we are, we are unable to give protection but we have assured that all the protection that is necessary to the residents and the, the complex where she had lived her family has stayed will be given protection. But the person must come. The person must make the complaint. We are virtually convinced on this matter to the Swiss government also. Our position, our law honorable state minister stated the law is clear. A statement has to be made or a complaint has to be made by the so called victim. What was given to the foreign ministry was just the fact that there has been an alleged abduction. Subsequently, the embassy has provided the CID, which was investigating this case, with a sequence of events. As we said on Sunday in our statement, and I will quote that paragraph again, while the embassy had not presented the alleged victim to be interviewed by the law enforcement officials, despite their request to do so, Based on the information provided by the Swiss mission on Friday 29th November, the investigation was nevertheless conducted. The ambassador was presented this on Sunday with clear evidence that the sequence of events and timeline of the alleged incident as formally presented by the Swiss mission on behalf of the alleged victim to the CID did not in any way correspond with the actual movements of the alleged victim on that date and we are talking of Monday 25th November as borne out by witness interviews and technical evidence including Uber records, CCTV footage, telephone records and GPS data. Given by a doctor in Switzerland who has, has, a, had a, has on video link examined the patient, so-called patient, and has made some observations. We are not aware, we have not been presented any evidence of any local doctor. Gel scene action. Anti germ mouthwash summing in a close up gel like a story ka start karana. Now, following Sri Lanka's written representations to the UK's Conservative Party leadership over the reference to a two state solution in its new manifesto ahead of the December 12th elections, the party has been quick to deny the possible changes in its long held policy on Sri Lanka. However, Dr. Palita Kohana shed some light on the confusion, stating that the inclusion of the ambiguous reference remains an attempt to garner support from the UK's large Tamil community. The UK's Conservative Party manifesto of the upcoming parliamentary election has created quite an uproar over comments indicating the willingness of a future Boris Johnson-led government to support a two-state solution for Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Manisha Gunasekara, had made strong representations in writing on the 27th of November to the co-chair of the Conservative Party, James Cleverley, calling the stated two-state solution unacceptable, recalling that such a stance has never before been the position of any party in power. Ambassador Gunasekara reaffirmed that successive British governments led by all parties have always supported peace and reconciliation in a united Sri Lanka and call for the amendment of the reference to reflect the party's final position. In response, Conservative Party Deputy Chairman MP Paul Scully this morning tweeted saying there is no Conservative manifesto comment relating to the makeup of governance of Sri Lanka. He added that the two-state reference only relates to the Middle East. This was, however, after retweeting a UK Tamil Conservative's Twitter post highlighting the manifesto's Sri Lankan two-state reference on the 25th of November, just two days before Sri Lanka diplomatic representations were made and the protests lodged. Former Secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Dr. Palita Kohona believes that the reference in the Tory manifesto remains an attempt to push through conservative terminology aimed at placating the UK's vast Tamil community ahead of key elections. I find uh, Paul Scully's verbal gymnastics absolutely hilarious. We know that there is only one place in the world where the United Nations has endorsed 
a two-state solution, that is between Palestine and Israel. Even here, it was the Brits who created the problem in the first instance through their Balfour Declaration. We are more than aware of what Britain did by dividing up Pakistan and India. 1.6 million deaths, endless millions displaced, and we are still talking about two two state solutions to other places. I'm glad in a way that Paul Scully had said that this two state approach would not apply to Sri Lanka, but I'm, I wonder whether this was again a piece of constructive terminology, a constructive use of language in the lead up to the elections to keep the British Tamils happy. Britain has made enough mischief around the world, and my friends in the Conservative Party would agree with that by adopting this type of approach to situations which need to be addressed much with much more care and sensitivity. I hope that the former colonial master will not wish to get involved in Sri Lanka's problems and let Sri Lanka deal with its own problems in its own way. And I'm sure that Sri Lanka is quite capable of dealing with its internal problems without gratuitous assist from the colonial, former colonial master. दरुआंगे आस्थी प्रतिशत्ति करने पर दिए सह मानसिक क्रिया निश्चित परिधि पाक वागने आमर दायक बने कैल्शियम विटामिन सी सह याकड़ा डांगु माइलो समग्री पोषण इंटी दे रही थे फ्रिज संधा सिरक तिहक तक का वाट्टा दिवेना पूरा सॉफ्ट लगिंग सह सॉफ्ट लगिंग मैक्स प्रदर्शन आगार वलीन Now, the permanent High Court at Bar today ordered the temporary release of Perpetual Treasury's Chairman Jeffrey Aloysius's passport, enabling him to travel overseas for medical treatment. What's more, the Attorney General's office also informed court that Singapore's AG's chambers is currently studying documents directed by Sri Lanka seeking the extradition of former Governor of the Central Bank, Arjuna Mahendran, when the case was taken up today. The Attorney General has informed the permanent High Court at Bar that Singapore's Attorney General's chambers is currently studying the documents directed by the Sri Lankan government requesting the extradition of former Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahendran. The case was heard before a special High Court judge bench today. The Attorney General's department also told court that Singapore's Attorney General's chambers require more time to conclude the process. The tenth defendant in the case, Ajahn Puncheheva, who is currently living in Singapore absconding court, was previously issued summons to appear before the bench. The Deputy Solicitor General, however, informed court that this summons has not been directed to the defendant, citing a delay in the process. Considering the presented facts, the three-member judge bench ordered to reissue summons on Punjiheva. The bench also ordered to temporarily release the passport of Perpetual Treasuries Limited Chairman Jeffrey Lotius under two personal bills, each worth 2.5 million rupees, permitting him to travel overseas for medical treatment until the 6th of January. The case was subsequently scheduled to be taken up again on the 31st of March 2020. Now, following the inclement weather conditions prevailing around the island, the Department of Meteorology believes that an improvement in the conditions could be expected in the next few days. Meanwhile, floods in the Batikla district appear to be receding as of today as well. The southern and western provinces of the island have been affected by adverse weather due to turbulence in the lower atmosphere over the island. Colombo received rainfall over 75 mm leading to flooding of areas around the city. The Department of Meteorology stated that rainfall over 150 mm can be expected in the districts of Trincomalee, Batiklo, Ampara, Mulathu, Nuralia, Badulla and Monragala, while rainfall over 100 mm is expected in the Mathale, Kandy, Jaffna, Mana, Kilinochi and Vaunia districts. Due to the prevailing bad weather, spill gates of both the Angamu and Rajangane reservoirs have been opened. The Batiklo district being the most affected by the bad weather however experienced a reduction in its flood levels. Meanwhile the residents of the Atikehel Kanda and Katwalanda villages belonging to the Passara and Kanavarala Grama Seva divisions claim that their villages face a serious landslide threat. Heavy rainfall has affected the Mulathi on Radhapura road as of last afternoon. Residents blame the removal of Ahatugaswava tank bund by Mahavil engineers as the main reason for the flooding. Meanwhile bad weather affected residents of Manchole, Rahmatpuram, 
Khatan Kurawa and Akarapaha belonging to the Mundali Divisional Secretariat. Due to the excess rainfall in the areas for the past one and a half months, houses, roads and farmland have been inundated and destroyed. The Putlam Disaster Management Unit blames illegal blockages of the neutral drainage lines by residents as the main reason for the rise in groundwater levels. Dr. Vasanta Senadira of the National Building Research Organization said that some landslide warnings have been issued to some areas in the Uva, Central and Sabargamo provinces. With the prevailing weather condition, National Building Research Organization has issued landslide early warning to the following areas Haldumulla, Passara, Lunukala, Alla, Haliala, Badulla, Abutale, Balangoda, Bandaravela, Sarantata, Uva Parnagam and Valimara DS Division in Badulla District, Udunuvara, Udapalata, Pathaheva Hata, Gangavata Korle, Madadumbara and Ududumbara DS Division in Kandy District, Hangurankata, Nuvaradia, Valapane and Amagamu Korle in DS Division in Norelia District, Balangoda, Imulpe, and Kolonna DS Division in Ratnapura District. Further, during this landslide early warning period, NBRO request from the people pay attention to the following three landslide signs development of cracks on the ground, deep one cracks and ground subsidence, slanting of trees, electrical posts, fences, and telephone posts, cracks in the floors and walls, or buildings where are built at slope areas, sudden appearance of springs, emerging muddy water, blockage or disappearance of existing springs. Furthermore, people living in the landslide area should be extra vigilant and should be ready to move quickly to safe places if heavy rain continues. Deputy Director of the Disaster Management Centre, Pradeep Kodi Pili, meanwhile explained what measures students sitting for the GCE Ordinary Level Examination must take in case they encounter difficulties brought on by inclement weather. So there are speed currents being uh, reported and people are advised to be refrained from uh, using these uh, waters of these particular sources. Badula district, there are special requests from the Badula district having uh, uh, the raining, a uh, lot of uh, rainfall recorded being in Badula district and the Roads, some roads been inundated. Alavai road is a bit risky, and people need to be get uh, the alternatives. Relief services been completely uh, the cope with uh, the uh, relief uh, things. The National Disaster Relief Services Center and uh, with up to the district level, under the supervision of district secretaries. Disaster situation for the uh, the students that they are writing the examinations by uh, tomorrow. That uh, the parents has to be very vigilant with that situation. The examination department and the disaster management center has a common plan and the agenda. So uh, the communities have. Are requested to alert the call to 117 call center number or 267002 number inform the situation so all the students and will be given provided uh, the facilities by the department of examination with the support of uh, with the coordination of uh, the disaster management center back after this very short break stay with us Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, governors to the eastern and north central province were appointed today by President Gautabi Rajpaksha at the Presidential Secretariat. While earlier today, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha met with High Commissioners of Bangladesh, New Zealand and Canada at Temple Trees. President Gautabi Rajpaksha appointed new governors of the north central and eastern province today with the Presidential Secretariat hosting the relevant ceremony. Anuradha Yampa took oaths before this president as the governor of the north central province. Meanwhile, the new governor of the eastern province is Professor Tessavitarna. In the meantime, several foreign envoys called on Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa today. The Premier had his first meeting with the High Commission of Bangladesh, Riyaz Hamidullah, where he handed over an epistle containing an invitation by Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina inviting the Sri Lankan PM to visit her country. The High Commission of New Zealand, Joanna Kempers, in response to Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa's comment of easing the business registration process in the country as before, said that New Zealand would offer the required assistance to make this a possibility, being ranked first in the Ease of Doing Business Index. It was the Canadian High Commissioner David McKinnon who called on the Sri Lankan PM last. He had made suggestions for investment possibilities within the country and expressed that he is looking forward to seeing Sri Lankan citizens residing in Canada making investments in the country. Now, Speaker Karu Jayasure says that the chief prelates of the Malvatta and Askiria chapters requested him to intervene in bringing the United National Party onto the right track, instilling unity and discipline. 
Media reports, meanwhile, surfaced today saying that the UNP seniors had decided to let Speaker Karu Jayasuri steer the UNP through the upcoming general election. In the meantime, while addressing a media briefing, UNP MP Navin Disanayka also conceded that the name of Karu Jayasuri has been thrown into the hat for the party leadership. Pakshe, Labunu, Paraja, Nihatamani, Piliganda, Apikamati, Apihitu, Paraja, Neve, make a meat maker, Itamat, Anta Paraja, Sajatika Pakshe, single about the Padanama, Sabavin, Madedratino, Mangitan Nevisham, Apage Samar, Naikan, Prakash, Balapalatino, Mangala Samarira, Metumagi, the Hasha, Ranja Drama, Naik Matumagi, statements. අපිට බලපෑවා කියලා මම පුද්ගලික හිතනවා. සිංහල බෞද්ධ පදනම ආරක්ෂා කිරීමට ගත යුතු සියලුම ක්‍රියාමාර්ග අපි ගත යුතුයි. කාටවත් කඩාගෙන යන්න බෑ. පොහොට්ටුව වගේ වෙනම දේශපාලන පක්ෂයක් ඇති කරගෙන එක්සත් ජාතික පක්ෂයේ ඡන්ද කඩන එක අමාරු කාර්යභාරයක්. ඒක ගාමිණි දිසානායකටත් බැරි වුණා, ලලිත ඇතුළත් මුදලිටත් බැරි වුණා, රුක්මන් සේනානායකටත් බැරි වුණා. පොඩි පොඩි ෂොට්ස් ගහනවා සමහර කට්ටිය මෙහෙම මේ තනතුරු දුන්නේ නැත්නම් කඩාගෙන එහෙම යනවා කියලා. අපි ඒවට බය නැහැ. එහෙම හිතන කට්ටියට මේ මම ආයෙත් ආයාචනා කරනවා අලුතෙන් හිත හිතලා බලන්න කියලා. විපක්ෂ නායක ධුරේ සම්බන්ධව මේ රණිල් වික්‍රමසිංහ මහතුමා ඊටමත් ධනාත්මක මතයක් දරන්නේ. තුමා මේ තනතුරු බදාගෙන ඉන්න කැමති නැහැ. ඉතින් සජිත් ප්‍රේමදාස මහතුමාගේ නම සඳහන් වෙලා තියෙනවා විපක්ෂ නායක ධුරේ. ඒ ගැන අපිට සාකච්ඡාවක් අපිට හිට කරන්න පුළුවන් group එකේ. පක්ෂ නායක ධුරේ ගැන විවිධ මත තියෙනවා පක්ෂයේ. ඉතින් ඒකට කරු ජයසූරිය මහතුමාගේ නමත් සඳහන් වෙලා තියෙනවා. නායක the media, however, reported today that it is proposed that a leadership board be appointed with Karuja Surya as its chairman on the party's complete restructure. It also said that the UMP seniors had agreed to let Karuja Surya handle the party during the looming general election. With that being the case, Speaker Karuja Surya called on the chief prelate of the Malvata chapter. Most Venerable Tibba Tuave Sri Sumangalatera in Kandy this morning. Afterwards, he called at the Askiriya Temple and had an audience with Chief Prelate of the Askiriya Chapter, Most Venerable Varaka Goda Sri Jnana Ratanatera. Later, he spoke to the media. UPFA parliamentarian of the Ratnapura district, Ranji Desoiza, passed away this morning at the age of 57. The parliamentarian had been receiving medical treatment at a hospital in Singapore at the time of his passing. Born in 1962, Desoiza had served as the chairman of the Atakalampan Pradesha Sabha of Godakvela back in 1997 before becoming its opposition leader in 2002. He later served as a provincial councillor of Sabaragamua, holding several ministerial portfolios there between 2004 and 2008. Late MP Ranjit Desoiza was first elected to parliament in 2010 from the Rakwan electorate and he was re elected to parliament in 2015. He was also a deputy national organiser of the joint opposition. His family members said that late Desoiza's remains will be brought to the country for, from Singapore tonight and details of his final rise will be later announced. In the meantime, former provincial councillor Varuna Lienege is next in line to fill the parliamentary seat vacated by late MP Desoiza. We'll be right back after this uh, commercial break. Stay with us. Now, Sri Lankan shares dipped today, weighed down by consumer staple companies and as far as selling dented sentiment. All share price index closed down 0.14% at 6,214.99, its lowest since November 28th. Its bulls gained 1.5% last week and is up 2.54% for the year. Foreign investors were sellers today in the equity market for the 25th session out of last 28. They sold a net 176 million rupees worth of shares today, extending the year-to-date foreign outflow to 10.8 billion rupees. Now, equity market turnover was 824.6 million Sri Lankan rupees, more than this year's daily average of around 726.4 million rupees. Last year's daily average was 334 million Sri Lankan rupees. 
Now here's a look at the bourse's performance today and uh, right after that you'll get a currency update. Uh, the secondary market yield curve remained uh, broadly unchanged while the overall market remained uh, with uh, moderate volumes. Uh, in the central bank uh, auction, uh, bill auction today, the six months and one year saw its uh, rates uh, declining by uh, seven basis points each to 7.6% and 8.22% respectively, while the three months uh, remained broadly the same. Uh, in the equity market, the bows ended in the red uh, for the second consecutive trading session, uh, mainly dragged down by the loss in uh, John Case Holdings and uh, Melster Corp. The parcel trades in uh, commercial bank and Ceylon theatres contributed about 9% uh, to the turnover. Uh, foreigners were net sellers uh, during the day today with uh, low foreign participation. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.